Hi, my name is Kate Shear, and today I am going to be talking to you about broadening our understanding of what sustainability is um, and how that can be really helpful in trying to create some lasting change towards sustainability. So quickly, um, most of you are probably familiar with these goals. In case you're not, these are the UN's 17 um, sustainability goals. Um, a lot of them, as you can see, are um, environmental, but others are social or economic, so quite a wide variety. Um, as it currently stands, museums are typically engaging with uh, sort of these four goals. They're the ones that are quite clearly um, an easy fit with museums. What I'm going to try and encourage you today in this uh, presentation is to really expand your thinking about this and see how the work that museums do can fit actually into just about all of these categories. Um, museums have tended to focus on the environmental side of the goals as far as going green, things like um, making sure that your building is greener, um, doing some presentations on environmental issues. Those are fantastic and museums absolutely should continue doing that. They're very popular um, and it is an important step, but we need to really see the, the broader picture of sustainability in order to create some lasting change. And we need to see some of the things open air museums are already doing as working towards those goals. So I'm going to take you through this um, complicated looking diagram first um, to explain why I think that this is an important thing to see um, in a broader, with a broader lens. Um, we'll go through each of these boxes um, at a time so I can explain it starting up here at the top with the do dominant social paradigm. So this, uh, we'll call it DSP, so I don't lose my voice. Um, the DSP is essentially the set of values and beliefs and attitudes that the average person in Western society holds today. Um, sort of the, prevail the prevailing, um, prevailing feelings and attitudes about how society should work, how life works, um, response to problems that arise, that kind of thing. So this has been identified by psychologists. There's a whole set of beliefs and attitudes um, and opinions. I've, I've pulled a few out that are um, closely related to how people see environmental issues and sustainability. So this DSP then is going to naturally color how people see the world. Um, so following on from it, um, we end up with this real belief in a natural um, societal and environmental hierarchy. So both the belief that humans are controlling nature, are um, above nature, and um, also the belief that some people are in power over other people who have less power. So um, kind of two sides of that. This in turn can lead to some institutions and systems being quite exploitive. So if you think that some people are in charge of nature um, or of people, you can see how you, would you could end up with some systems that didn't protect the rights of the groups or of nature that were sort of at that bottom tier. Um, so this could be an issue for governments, for um, organizations, for companies, for economic systems. Um, this, you know, exploitation can be an issue in many, um, many parts of our, how our world works. So following on from these institutions and systems, you can then end up with exploitation of people. Um, this can be things like economic exploitation. There are a lot of issues currently around manufacturing practices and um, wealthier countries um, buying products from places where human rights may not be in the same um, sort of position. Um, it could be people not having that sort of social or political power to create change in their lives. A whole variety of things um, just stemming from the fact that some people feel that they are in a position of higher power while others are in a position of lower power. Going back then to the exploitive institutions and systems, you can see that the natural, the, it also leads to exploitation of natural resources and the environment. Um, so very similarly to exploitation of people, this occurs when people feel above the environment and feel that resources are there to be used. Um, so a, a real strong correlation with the DSP has also been shown to correlate with uh, less concern for the environment, less belief that environmental issues need attention, that kind of thing. 
Um, and the mechanism by which this all happens um, is that the dominant social paradigm um, makes people feel that the most important thing is to uphold their way of life, uphold the status quo, uphold those hierarchies, and that, that their understanding of how life should be um, is so strong that it justifies exploitation of both of people and of the environment. You can also see at the bottom this arrow between the two. Um, there is quite a strong correlation between exploitation of people and of the environment. Um, studies have shown that people who uh, tend to be more exploitive of the environment also tend to be more sexist and more racist. So there is undeniably a connection between those forms of exploitation. Okay, so here's the whole picture again. Um, most experts think that without changing that DSP, um, it's going to be really tricky to change very much of what um, goes on through these systems. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that all systems are exploitive in this way, but there is this, um, there is the possibility of that happening until a shift is made in people's attitudes and beliefs. Um, so if we are to get rid of that DSP, obviously that changes things all the way down um, and it's really possible to make some lasting change and that's change that would help both people who are being exploited and also the environment. It would help to inspire more environmental action and protection. So how do we do that? How do we disrupt that DSP? Um, from research, solutions from people who know much more about this than I do, um, typically fall into two, um, two areas. The first is fostering feelings of empathy and inclusion, um, and the second is helping people to see nature as part of their own identities. So we'll talk about mo these in more detail now. Um, first is fostering feelings of empathy. So from social justice, we know that people Everyone in their heads has sort of an in-group of people and an out-group, and that's just part of our biology. That's not something that we can um, get rid of, but you can expand people's in-group um, by helping them to have shared experiences with people they perceive as in their out-group. So if you have an experience shared with someone who is very different to you, you will then start seeing that they're not as different and they will become part of your in-group. Um, so this same thing can be done um, with the environment, um, with perspective taking. Um, there's been some studies to show that it works similarly when people see the environment as not separate to themselves, but a part of who they are. Um, open air museums are fantastic for this because uh, they provide this really sensory and immersive experience that can be shared um, with people in the past. So when a visitor walks in um, to an open air museum, they may, might feel quite separate from people who lived hundreds or thousands of years ago. Um, but when you walk into a structure or you look across structures, you smell um, f smoke, those kinds of sensory things you think, you find yourself thinking, is this what someone saw or heard or smelled years and years and years ago? And that shared experience with someone in the past um, helps people to understand that they're not very different to those people from a long time ago, but actually people are people. Um, so seeing those parallel human experiences play out in the past, um, and particularly first-person stories, really creates a lot of empathy. Um, the Last year for my dissertation, I went, I did quite a lot of research around um, open-air museums and empathy. Um, the, the neuroscience mechanism for this is interesting, um, and basically the medial prefrontal cortex is the area of the brain that's responsible for empathy, um, and Luckily for us, the same part of the brain is stimulated by physical and sensory experiences. So at an open air museum, you have this ideal situation where this part of the brain is quite stimulated by the sights and sounds and just that immersive experience open air museums provide. Um, and so then using that same area of the brain to then build empathy um, is just a, a really um, fantastic opportunity to do some work there. Um, this also, this part of the brain leads to long-term memories and learning. Um, so it's something that's going to stick with visitors in a really powerful way. In my research for my dissertation, I also asked people their reasons for visiting heritage sites. Um, it could be anything from a fun day out to learning about another way of life. Um, as you can see, I've then correlated two responses. Um, 
people who answered to find a connection to people of the past or who answered to imagine I'm actually in the past. Um, those were the two I pulled out as the ones that are really seeking that sort of empathetic connection to people from a long time ago. Um, and as you can see, it does vary quite a lot by group, but roughly a quarter to a third um, of people are really interested in that connection. Um, and particularly younger visitors, 18 to 30 year olds, um, are, are much more likely to be seeking that connection. So I think increasingly, um, as younger visitors are visiting museums more, that's going to become something that's really sought after in the visitor experience. So the second way to disrupt that DSP, um, going, going back to this, is helping people see nature as part of their identity. Um, so um, this essentially is helping people to see they aren't separate from nature, they are a part of nature. And for some visitors to open air museums, that might be quite a foreign concept. They may not have access to nature. And so again, as open air museums, there's this massive potential um, because open air museums have open air to start with. Um, they can design experiences in nature. They can tell the story of humans and nature in the past in a really powerful way. Um, and another thing that's important is that learning, it's been shown that learning facts about nature can actually decrease feelings of connection. It can make you feel, um, make, make you feel further from nature because you're just learning a fact. But having an actual immersive experience in nature helps to, to um, strengthen that connection. So open air museums tend to be more experiential than a brick and mortar museum. So this is a huge opportunity to help people have those experiences in a way that doesn't feel like learning, but does feel like connection. Another interesting note is that visitors, this has to be done quite tactfully, um, visitors do not feel it's a high priority task for museums to do things like help vulnerable people or protect the environment. And in fact, they don't want visitors to be promoting social justice or human rights or um, visitors really were not very, um, very keen on participatory practice in general. Um, these are attitudes that I think will shift. Younger visitors tend to be more interested in these things than older visitors. So there is a generational aspect, but um, it's just to be aware that Museums need to think not about doing something going in a completely different direction, but actually taking the experience they already provide and making sure that those experiences in nature and those em empathy increasing um, experiences are just uh, really developed to their full potential. So these are things that museums, open air museums are already doing. They're already doing well. And with a bit of planning and a bit of just careful thought in it, we can do that even better. So in conclusion, we need to really look beyond just going green. Um, we need to see sustainability. We need to see more of what open air museums do with sustainability because actually the work they're doing with people is every bit as important as the work they're doing with um, the environment itself. Um, museums can really develop their, um, their natural areas, their outdoor areas to maximize, um, maximize the connection people feel and really, again, increase those experiences um, for empathy and decreasing prejudice to really sort of try and shift people's opinions and attitudes and create, to create lasting change. So finally, um, although we started out looking at those first four goals, what I'm hoping this talk has shown you is that actually the work you or your museum might be doing might fit into many, if not all, of these goals. And we need to look at them as a whole picture in order to create some change really from the ground up um, using the fantastic experiences our open air museums already provide and, um, and moving in this way um, in, in towards empathy moving towards a greater understanding of the big picture of sustainability. Thanks so much. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.